Hello and welcome to EE254. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to access the individual elements in a vector. This video is part of a larger set of videos that focus on the fundamentals of MATLAB that's intended to be sort of a refresher or maybe an expansion of your knowledge of the fundamentals of MATLAB. So in this video, we're going to focus on two things, how to access a vector and then how to use a vector, meaning some basic operations on a vector. Now, this video assumes that you've already watched the, the first video on how to create vectors and that essentially you understand that a vector is nothing more than a one by 10 collection of values of the same data type. Sorry, not one by 10, <laughs> one by n collection of values of the same data type. Now, there are ways to get around the data type issue, but for all of the examples that we're going to be doing now, we're going to have the same data type. Also, it can be in addition to an n, one by n, you can also have an m by one collection of values. The reason I use the word collection is that I don't want to imply any mathematical relationship or physical relationship between the values. They could theoretically just simply be a random collection of integers or a random collection of doubles. Now, to begin with, we need one of these collections of values. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off using the variable a, once again, not the best variable name. But what I would like to do is I would like to create a vector using the pi function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vector that starts at 0 and increments by pi over 16 and ends at simply 2 times pi. Now, I always get a little nervous when I do not use parentheses, so I will also get into the habit of surrounding both the, in this case, the increment and the end of my colon notation here example with an additional set of parentheses. Technically, you don't need those, but in this case, what I have done is I have now created a 1 by 33 vector of doubles. Now, the reason I know that it's a 1 by 33 vector of doubles is because you can see it down in the command window. You can actually see, because I highlighted and ran it without the semicolon, you can see all of the values in this vector. Now, I've also picked the colon notation for this example so that we all have the same values when you're following along, and also that this is reproducible. So. The second thing you can notice is up here in the workspace is that I have my size selected. And if you do not see that, just remember to right click and add size as one of your column headers. But what if you didn't want to rely on that? In other words, let's say that you were writing some code that needed to check to see the size of the vector before continuing on with an operation. And we will be doing that quite a bit, by the way. Well, there's a couple of different ways that we can go about doing this. But before we do that, I want to take just a second to use that, that transform, that transpose one more time. And I want to transpose A into a 33 by 1 column vector. And note that it's going to have the same values, but just with a different orientation. So this is going to be a 33 by 1 vector of doubles, but more importantly, the same values as A, just in a different orientation. Well, why do I care? Well, it turns out that if I use the length function, the length function will tell me how many elements are in A. That sounds great, except for the fact that it will also return how many elements are in B. In this case, it will also be 33. So in other words, from the length perspective, these are the same length vectors. No big deal. 
But what happens if you aren't dealing with a one by N or an M by one? What we're going to see, particularly when we start focusing in on arrays, is that the length function, while useful, can lead to some problematic results, particularly when you aren't expecting one of the dimensions to be longer than the other. So how do we get around that? And that is where the size function comes into play. And so the size of A gives you two values, 1 and 33. So it's very important to note here that this returns back a vector of values, two values. So 1 by 33. And the size of B will return back a 33 by one. Why is this more useful? Well, because what you can do now is you can say something like rows A, in other words, just simply the number of rows of A is going to be equal to the size of A. And remember the size of A gives you two values. Well, what you can actually do now is you can specify whether you're interested in the first or the second dimension. And the way you do this, actually, let me, uh, let me modify this slightly. I'm going to call this the size of A. And now if I say size of A, parentheses 1, you'll notice that it gives me the first dimension of the size A variable. So in other words, the first value out of that vector. All right, continuing on with this, we can also do the size of B is just simply equal to the size of B. And you'll see that that's a 33 by 1. And I'm going to just note here that this is the rows in A. And then if I do the size B parentheses 1, this tells me the rows in B. And just for documentation's sake, I'm going to go ahead and put what those are going to be. Well, that brings us back to how do we actually access individual elements in a vector. So we aren't with arrays yet. We're not looking at multi dimensions. We're just going to focus in on single values. And to do that, what we do is we'll start with our A vector. And if we were just to type in A down here in the command window, you would get all of the values. But let's say we were only interested in the first value. So A parentheses 1. You'll notice that it is the it is zero. So this represents the first value in A. A parentheses two is going to be, as you guessed, the second value in A. This is why I said in the earlier video that it is important to note that with vectors, you're not only interested in the variable name and the data type, but also the values and the location of those values. So the index in this particular example, or the location is two, but the value, if we were to run this real quick, is going to be 0.1963. So it's important to note here, and I'm just going to take a second here to point out that index equals to two and the value is equal to 0.1963. And we can continue on a parentheses three. This is the third value. And I'll stop in a little bit with this excessive documentation, but we're just doing this right now so that we make sure that we do understand how this works. So you'll see now that the third value is going to be equal to 
to seven. And you can always come up here to the workspace, double click on A and confirm it. Sure enough, the third value is 0.3927. Now keep in mind, we're not seeing the full precision here. This is just simply the four first four values here. Now, we can continue this manually all the way through until the 33rd value. And so we'll start off, we're gonna put a little note here, dot, 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 uh, meaning that we could continue on manually, but we're gonna focus in on the 32nd value. And so you'll see that the 32nd value is 6.0868. And then we can also do the 33rd value which is going to be the 6.28, which you should notice is roughly 3.14 times two. So this represents then the second to last value. And this represents the last value. Well, so far so good. But what if we accidentally went past? So in other words, if I typed in a 34, well, you're gonna get a nasty message that says index exceeds array bounds. And so this will not work. As a matter of fact, we wanna take a second to go ahead and comment this out, but index exceeds array bounds. So you can't attempt or MATLAB will not let you access an element outside the boundaries of the array, which brings us to the point of what happens if you accidentally do a parentheses zero, much like you would do in C. Once again, you get another warning here. This is an array index indices must be positive integers or logical values. So MATLAB will only get let you get into so much trouble. It, will definitely let you get into a lot of trouble, but even it has its limitations. Well, how can we then access the last value in the vector without necessarily having to hard code it or specifically check the length or the size? We could do that. Length or size would be perfectly good ways of going about doing this. But instead, what we can do is we can leverage another keyword. So we can say a parentheses end, and this will give us the last value. So this right here is the last value. And likewise, a parentheses end minus one will give us the second to last value. So essentially what happens here is we can work backwards in the vector by simply using the end keyword. Now, how can we access multiple values in the vector? Well, it turns out that we can actually nest a vector within a vector. In other words, we can actually use a vector as indices. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but what if I just simply wanted to get the first five values? So I showed you how to get the first value, the second value, and so on. We could do this manually if we really wanted to. So that would be a parentheses one, a parentheses two, a parentheses three, a parentheses four, and a parentheses five. That quite frankly, looks like a terrible idea. It will, however, work. So this is the, these, this is the first five values. Well, instead, what we would want to do is we would just simply want to use a vector for the indexes. So in this case, one colon one colon five allows for us then to create a vector of indices starting with one and continuing to five. And you'll see that this has the exact same result. Essentially this one colon one colon five expands out to one, two, three, four, five, and then allows for you then to collect those values together. So <clears throat> we'll come back to this in just a little bit, but hopefully this gives you a nice overview then of how you can access 
individual values in a vector as well as a small portion of a vector. So in the next video, we'll focus in on some of the vector operations as well as some of the sample functions. Um, hopefully you found this video useful. I'm gonna to try to keep these videos fairly short and to the point so that if you have any questions, you can email me and I'm of course happy to create more content. Thank you for watching.